Good evening and thank you for joining us at the Wolf Humanities Center tonight for what promises to be a truly timely discussion. I'm Sophie Rosenfeld, project director for this year, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you today our speaker, Alex Guerrero, previously a faculty member here at Penn with appointments in philosophy, medical ethics, and law, and currently Rutgers term, sorry, Henry Rutgers term chair and associate professor of philosophy at Rutgers University. He's gonna be talking to us tonight about the topic of his forthcoming book, which is titled like tonight's talk, Lotocracy, a new kind of democracy. And that means he's going to be talking to us not just about how we choose our elected officials or representatives now, but how and why we might choose them differently in the future. We knew when we invited Alex that we were, the election season was the right time to bring him aboard. And we were delighted that he accepted our invitation. But we didn't know when we invited him, and he certainly couldn't have known some years ago when he started working on this topic, just how relevant it would be to our moment, maybe even to this week. So we're really delighted to have him here, and I hope you'll stay not just for the talk, but for what we expect to be a lively Q&A afterwards. Please put your questions in the question and answer function below, and we'll try to answer and address as many of them as we can. Thanks so much, Alex. So I start talking now. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's really uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be in front of all of you in person, um, but I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and hear what you have to, you know, uh, hear what you think about um, the topic of today's presentation. So it's a book I've been working on for some time um, on using lotteries rather than elections to choose political officials. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides now. Um, let's click a few buttons, hope this works. All right, so absent somebody saying otherwise, I'm assuming you can now see a slide that says Lotocracy, a new kind of democracy. Uh, so that's the title of the book that I have coming out hopefully next year. And in the book, there's really two big things that happen. Uh, the first big thing is a kind of criticism of electoral representative democracy along a number of different dimensions. Uh, that's part one. That sets up the second part of the book in which I try to set out a new kind of political system, one that would use lotteries rather than elections to choose political representatives one that would basically do away with the executive role entirely and replace the executive with something like a number of randomly selected cabinets, uh, but of many more citizens than you know, just one or two, uh, and that would sort of try to sketch an alternative that really might work at the level of a nation state. Uh, that's a big project. So uh, many of you, and I too, have questions about how that might go in the details. As a philosopher, I see my role as kind of sketching some possibilities. And so that's what I'll try to do in the talk today. Uh, okay, so just as an introduction, so a lot of these ideas are old. They go all the way back to Aristotle, to ancient Athens. Uh, Aristotle writes, the appointment of magistrates by lot, by lottery, is thought to be democratic and the election of them oligarchic. So one of the themes that I'll hit with respect to elections is that they choose a kind of socioeconomic elite rather than uh, choosing a kind of true microcosm of the full political community. Uh, another familiar quote uh, from Churchill, so no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it's been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So I think of this as kind of the Churchillian shrug, this thought, yeah, we know it's not perfect. We know the system has problems, but what might be better? And I wanna really encourage everybody to move past that kind of thinking where we see what we have now as some kind of pinnacle of institutional design that couldn't be improved upon. I think most of us feel improvements could be made and should be made. And I think we all as citizens uh, should be thinking about how we might change the system to make things better. So a lot of discussion recently about the electoral college as opposed to selecting the executive through a national popular vote. That's one kind of example, uh, but I think there are many kind of more foundational things we should consider too. 
Uh, so in the background, uh, I have a view on which political systems, political institutions are really there to help us solve problems that we face because of the kinds of creatures we are. So we're social animals. We like living with each other, working with each other, but we run into various kinds of problems. Problems due to scarcity, ignorance, disagreement, conflict, domination, irrationality, prejudice, and so on. And so what political institutions, political systems are there to do is to kind of help us in various ways. So they can help us to prevent domination and harm, try to keep things balanced and keep us from harming each other in various ways, uh, support peaceful and productive living so that we can work together and rather than being at each other's throats, actually do things together that we couldn't do by ourselves. Uh, so working together, information control. So modern world is very complicated a lot of ideas and facts and expertise is dispersed throughout society. We need things, institutions to help bring that together so that it can be used to help us solve the problems that we face and political systems can be good at doing that. Uh, and in general, kind of promoting welfare, trying to make the lives of each of us better. Uh, so I think these are kind of central roles for political institutions. Uh, so this suggests this idea of sensibility as a political value. So it has two components. One is to appreciate or understand or know the world as it is. So kind of being in touch with reality. And then second, to respond to the world in light of that appreciation. So kind of know the world as it is and then also respond. So I think these are virtues of individual agents. So when people are praised as being rational, uh, you know, it's like, well, they're kind of understanding the world as it actually is, and then they're able to act in response in light of that. Um, the first really focuses on kind of epistemic virtues, as philosophers would call them. Uh, are we good at investigating and learning about the world? Are we good at sort of sharing information and retaining information that's actually uh, tracking reality? Uh, the second is sort of more about agential virtues. So rationality, steadfastness. So you get some information, how do you respond to you? How do you respond to it? Do you act accordingly? Okay, so I wanna suggest that electoral representative democracy, I think of this as a kind of democracy in which we elect representatives, has at least five pathologies that should trouble us. And I'm gonna go through those now. I won't read them all here. You'll get them all through the talk. So the first is the worry that public ignorance, so citizen ignorance, voter ignorance, undermines meaningful electoral accountability, and that results in what I'll call political capture. So electoral representative systems kind of set up what economists might call a principal agent relationship, uh, where we, all of us over here, are the principals, and the elected representatives are the agents who are supposed to kind of serve on our behalf. They're supposed to work for us. And the key question with any of these kinds of relationships is how can the principles, all of us, ensure that the agents are actually going to act on our behalf rather than just doing things to enrich themselves or to help their buddies and friends? Uh, how are we gonna make sure that happens? In the electoral context, the mechanism is supposed to be through electoral accountability. So that's gonna require having elections that are free and open where everyone can vote, everyone can run. Uh, they need to be relatively frequent. Uh, so if people go 30 years before they are reelected, uh, that's not gonna provide adequate accountability. They need to be genuinely competitive with real choice and they need to be fair. This is obviously something being discussed quite a bit this last week. Uh, the votes have to actually be counted. The votes have to count equally, uh, a lot of complexity there. And there might be a lot of problems just with these kind of basic things of running an election, um, financial barriers to running for office, lots of money in politics and campaigns in particular, lots of hurdles being put in place to keep people from registering and voting. You see the turnout this year just from having the ability to do mail-in voting at a wide scale. Um, and then things like intentional competition reducing gerrymandering where our choice space is really restricted uh, as a result of the way the districts have been drawn. So those are all things that already undermine electoral accountability. But I think that even if we had a system that didn't have those problems, there's this further issue where it's not enough to just have accountability and have a vote. It has to be meaningful where that's gonna be accountability that 
requires informed monitoring and evaluation of the decisions of elected representatives. Okay, so that kind of meaningful accountability is going to be thwarted by ignorance, right? And there's different kinds of ignorance that might be relevant here. So on one level, when I teach students about, you know, electoral politics, I often start by asking how many of you can, you know, raise your hand and identify who your representatives are. So, you know, who are your senators and who's the representative who represents your geographic district? Very few of them can name all three of those people. Right, so that's already one kind of problem. But even if you could name your representatives, there's gonna be a question about what they're actually doing while they're in office, right? So how are they spending their time? Who are they meeting with? What are they voting on? What are they advocating for? All of that is important, but many of us don't know very much about what's going on. A second kind of worry is even if you knew something about that, you need to know a lot about the actual issues. So if you hear, oh, on this piece of legislation, my congressperson voted yes or voted no. Well, if you don't know very much about that legislation in the details, it's not gonna help you very much in terms of actually being able to hold them accountable, right? So you'll just know this fact, but it won't really inform your judgment. Um, and then relatedly, kind of being able to assess whether this particular policy idea will be good for you and your family, the industry you work in, the people you care about, or good more generally for the country or for the world. All of those things are hard questions to answer. Uh, you know, and political scientists have spent the last 50 years basically documenting the pervasiveness of ignorance along these dimensions and others. So Larry Bartell says, the political ignorance of the American voter is one of the best documented features of contemporary politics. John Fairjohn, another political scientist says very similar thing. So you see this repeated over and over again. Voters don't know very much at all. Uh, they can't name basic facts about, you know, the different policy options, who has what in their platform, what issues are kind of on the horizon, what legislation is being contemplated, or even really basic things like how many people are on the Supreme Court, or even naming like a single Supreme Court justice, right? So this kind of political legal knowledge is just not widely held. All right, so the worry, uh, that might be troubling in its own right. So if this kind of ignorance is out there, it might lead us to make bad choices in terms of who we actually elect, right? So we might elect people who talk a good game, but then actually don't stand for things that we should care about or that we do care about. Uh, another worry is that in general, in the absence of kind of meaningful accountability, we should see, we should expect to see an increase in capture where an elected official is captured if that person uses his or her position to advance the interests of the powerful rather than to create policy that's in the interest of everybody, right? So you can see this in lots of cases where we don't know a lot about an issue, uh, health policy, incredibly complicated, incredibly technical area, uh, huge amounts of money, uh, you know, hospitals, insurance, doctors, uh, other medical professionals all have a part of this very complex system and very hard for voters to know very much about what policy would be better. They just want you know, their bills to be lower, they don't want to be bankrupt from health costs. Uh, but a worry is that you have special interests kind of lobbying very effectively behind the scenes, creating policy that's good for them, good for their interests, but maybe not good for everybody. So the second idea that this kind of capture is going to lead to pathology. Um, all right, so you imagine we're behind a brick wall, our representatives on the other side, we don't really know what they're doing in any kind of detail. And the worry is, one worry is that, you know, lobbyists are going around the side, working, you know, right over their shoulder, making sure they're doing things that uh, will be good for them, good for the industries they represent, but not necessarily good for everybody. And we won't know any better because we don't know enough about whether this makes for good policy or not. Uh, what we might see is that our problems aren't being solved and we might get frustrated with the system, but then we're often inclined, okay, I'll just try to choose somebody else maybe who will do a better job. Uh, but if the system doesn't get addressed in the right way, I think we don't have much reason to think just picking the right person is going to make a big difference. It might make a difference on the margins, no question, uh, but whether it's going to really address things, uh, I am somewhat skeptical. Okay, so a lot of empirical support from political scientists that this kind of capture is a problem. A lot of good books. Happy to share these slides with people if they want to just email me after. All right, the second concern. Um, 
electoral incentives lead to a kind of focus on the short term, right? This is pretty straightforward. Um, so as I was suggesting before, I think many modern policy uh, problems are complex. So they're technical, information intensive, in a way that renders it difficult for members of the political community to have informed beliefs and preferences about those problems. Uh, also, I think this other thing, opacity, whether elected representatives have actually acted or have tried to act to your benefit or the benefit of the political community is often not obvious, right? So they might talk a good game, but it might be hard for us to know if they're actually doing things that will be beneficial for us. And then that's true for things that don't even have a kind of long time horizon. Uh, but for problems that do, such as climate change, these things are gonna be intensified dramatically. So a problem with a long time horizon is one in which the adverse consequences won't be apparent in the near future, uh, but they will you know, materialize 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road. They'll also have these other features. So it's gonna be opaque to us whether actions taken now have addressed the problem, really. It's gonna be possible for people to deny the existence of the problem entirely without flouting a lot of available evidence. So if it's something that, well, we, you know, are we gonna see this problem materialize right in front of us uh, or not? It's gonna be possible for people to suggest that some other technological solution or something will come in and save the day. So we don't need to worry about it or take hard steps now. And maybe present costs will be highly salient, but future benefits won't be. So, you know, imagine trying to implement a gas tax that's going to be very expensive, really trying to change people's consumption patterns, how much they drive. That's going to annoy the heck out of people. They won't like it. And so, if you're an elected official who tries to implement that, you're going to pay a price for that. And if your opponent denies that climate change is even a problem, that's going to make it difficult for you to win elections against that kind of person. Right, so elected officials focus on the problems they can get credit for addressing or blame for not addressing, and they're going to avoid trying to incur uh, these other kinds of costs where they're not going to be electorally penalized otherwise. But that all just comes from these incentives that elected officials have to try to get reelected. And so they're trying to think in two, two year windows or four year windows or six year windows rather than 30 or 40 year windows. Okay, a third concern worry that electoral dynamics kind of combined with the ignorance problem we we're just talking about and maybe combined with what I'll talk about as bad press leads to a kind of manipulation and a focus on entertainment. Uh, so I think certain issues, crime, war, terrorism, sort of very easily and powerfully engage us, engage our emotions. Uh, we care a lot about them. If you put an advertisement on television with certain images, certain violent things, maybe uh, threatening us, we'll pay attention. Uh, but it becomes very easy to manipulate us in that way. Uh, so Drew Weston has this great work on the role of emotion in politics and the way in which it affects our judgment and affects what we respond to. Elected officials know we have limited attention spans. They try to capture our attention in a way where they're gonna be there to solve our problems. So trying to not appear soft on crime, for example. Uh, they want to seem tough. They want to seem like a leader who's going to make us safe, right? So they'll appeal to this kind of security and fear. More generally, all of us operate with kind of working stereotypes or what I call epistemic toolkits. Our kind of way of seeing the world, uh, including things like who we will listen to, what news channels will turn on, what technology we use to find out about the world, who our favorite experts are, uh, trusted sources, all of that kind of goes into this package of what I call an epistemic toolkit. Uh, it also includes things like the stereotypes we accept. All of us work with stereotypes of various kinds, the kind of generalizations and biases that inform our ordinary perspective. All right, so Neil Postman, I think very convincingly suggests that we've added a kind of entertainment filter to this epistemic toolkit with respect to politics. Uh, so he says, uh, entertainment is the supra ideology of all discourse on television. No matter what's depicted or from what point of view, the overarching presumption is that it's there for our amusement and pleasure. And I think this really focuses, uh, this really explains how and why we pay attention to what news we actually consume and how we learn about the political world. So we start with these epistemic toolkits and then we go out into the world and try to learn about politics, learn about who we should vote for, to inform our electoral choices. 
Uh, but we do this in a way that's kind of structured partly by what we enjoy, what's entertaining to us, what we agree with. Okay, so arguably many people in kind of uh, media studies and communication have suggested things along these lines. Um, the pressure on the press, on news media to amuse us, to entertain, to captivate our attention, to kind of keep our eyeballs requires offering a certain kind of media product. So you see exciting music, attractive hosts, flashy graphics, and a focus on certain things and not others. So things that are high uh, energy, high attention, high emotion, uh, detailed discussions of policy, you know, thumbs down, that's really boring. Uh, so, you know, in the book, I defend, you know, these commandments of the modern news media, you know, don't look or sound boring, don't challenge the audience's basic worldview, you don't want to upset them too much, don't try to counter their stereotypes, they'll get frustrated, don't assume or require any real background education or knowledge, don't perplex, don't complicate, pe you know, people's views, uh, don't try to present sophisticated, complex arguments and reasons and hypotheses, uh, and have a standard for newsworthiness so that you're not failing to cover anything that's going to draw eyeballs that your competitor is covering. All right, so that's going to really shape how people learn about the world. So this ignorance problem that I was talking about before gets compounded by even if we try to do a good job learning about the political world, uh, it's going to be structured through this entertainment lens. So, you know, we're broadly ignorant, we need education and information, we seek it out in these ways, that affects what we learn about. Uh, it also shifts us into what philosophers have been calling epistemic bubbles and echo chambers. So we mostly get information from sources that already resonate with us, that feed our worldview back to us, that we enjoy and can tolerate watching and that doesn't sort of serve to enrage us, that kind of matches with our preconceived ideas. Uh, but so we start shifting already into these epistemic bubbles and echo chambers. And that creates all kinds of problems relating to this fourth concern that electoral dynamics really exacerbate kind of in-group, out-group thinking. So Christopher Aiken and Larry Bartels in this great recent book, Democracy for Realists, they argue looking at a lot of political science data over the last 40, 50 years, many different kinds of studies, they argue that group attachments are partisan identities really and our social identities, these drive our thinking about politics rather than the other way around. So rather than kind of dispassionately sitting back and thinking about the 25 most important political issues and coming to have a view about each one that's really sensitive to the evidence that we've encountered and the research that we've done, we pretty much just opt for being on this team or that team and then start to see everything through those lenses. So, Elections, I think, really feed into this. Uh, so we're, you know, as I've said, broadly ignorant, but we enjoy the kind of character drama of elections and the people and the personalities involved. It's easy to feel like we have an informed view about this person rather than the policy that they might be thinking of implementing. Uh, and we're already kind of highly susceptible to this in-group, out-group thinking. And so we identify with our candidate or the party that we support, and then they're our team and we basically root for them as we might a sports team. So this has, I think, really serious epistemic consequences. So rather than dispassionately considering all the different evidence and making a decision, we just kind of go with the team. Uh, we come to really antagonize the other side and see them as untrustworthy, some cases even morally reprehensible. And so we're not gonna trust their evidence, trust their sources or listen to them as testifiers, even in cases when that is really unreasonable of us. So we're gonna filter evidence and experts and media consumption through this kind of partisan lens. And we get this because of elections, right? So we have this in-group, out-group dynamic already primed for us. Like I'll talk about social identity theory in a moment. Uh, Duverger's law is a finding in political science, maybe not quite to the level of a law as you might, you know, law of the physical world, but something close to it that says, if you have a political system like ours, in which there are elections, one political representative will be elected to represent a district, and the person elected is just going to be the person with the most votes in the election. If you have those two conditions, there will be only two viable political parties. There won't be meaningful third or fourth or fifth or sixth parties. Our choice will be limited and structured to A or B, and that's going to be you know, consistent over time. 
might have changes at the margin, but those will mostly come to affect the content of A and B, exactly what's in their platform, rather than destabilizing the two-party dynamic. That A and B dynamic, I think, really reinforces and connects to this in-group, out-group thing that already is primed in us. So social identity theory, work in social psychology has really suggested that we're primed to see in-groups and out-groups in this way, and that so much of what we do and respond to then is filtered through this. It happens sort of below the level of our awareness, uh, but you know things like trust and distrust and who we are going to favor, who we're going to go to, uh, who we're going to feel empathy with, all of that gets structured through the kind of, are they part of our in-group or not? Uh, furthermore, polarization, people have suggested, really results from this kind of in-group, out-group thinking where if you in an in-group say to another member of the in-group, well, maybe the out-group people aren't that bad. Maybe, you know, as a Democrat, I say, maybe the Republicans aren't that bad. Other Democrats will come yelling at you to kind of like stand in and say, look, I'm really deeply in the in-group. Maybe you should rethink what you're saying if you're really like a traitor and part of the out-group, uh, you'll start getting pushed into the out-group. Um, so this kind of dynamic has been very extensively studied. I think elections really reinforce it. So it also leads us to have this kind of in-group, out-group discord that I think we see really prominently with the you know, current situation now where you know, 77 million people voted for Biden, 72 million people voted for Trump. Most of those voters really are not close to liking people on the other side, at least not when they talk about politics. All right, I think we get this really heated and adversarial political competition it really shifts us away from trying to appreciate the world as it is and respond to it and respond to the political problems that affect all of us. All right, so Liliana Mason, a political scientist says, you know, our partisan identities have become these mega identities. And she describes a nation whose partisan teams are raring to fight despite an almost total lack of any substantive policy reasons to do so. So we're at each other's throats, but in a completely uh, unnecessary way, given how we're not that far apart on a lot of policy issues. Okay, a fifth concern about elections that it really selects the socioeconomic elite rather than everybody. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. So some basic statistics, uh, you know, uh, as of 2015, it's a little old now, uh, but nothing significant has changed there. 53 of the 535 congresspersons have a net worth of over $7 million, 80% are male, 80% are white. Most of them are lawyers or business people. It's a kind of narrow uh, selection of who's actually in uh, the political representation positions. Uh, so this is a chart of you know, Congress. The orange dots are lawyers. The green dots are business people. And then here and there, you'll see you know, an educator, a social worker, an engineer, but just here or there on the margins. All right, so I think lots of problems from this. Uh, we might worry about the priorities these people have. Uh, I worry too about the epistemic implications. What are the things they'll know about and focus on and uh, sort of think they understand but maybe not understand? So in philosophy, in epistemology, uh, work by feminist philosophers and philosophers uh, of race and gender uh, have identified what they call standpoint theory, have argued for what they call standpoint theory that suggests what one's able to see, understand, and explain is partly a function of one's social position. Uh, so people who have been oppressed often have to learn in a lot of detail about the systems of oppression and what the people are actually doing to oppress them. Um, furthermore, there are all kinds of suggestions that you just encounter different evidence depending on your social position. So if you've never had to wait in line for unemployment, you won't know about some of that bureaucratic process, at least not in the same way. If you've never had to raise a child on your own without help, again, you won't necessarily know what that experience is like and what some of the difficulties there might be. Okay, so I've identified these five problems. Question of, well, what can we do about it? Uh, a kind of modest set of answers says, well, let's work on the media, let's try to get money out of campaigns. What I wanna do here for the last 10, 15 minutes is go for a kind of less modest answer and say, let's rethink elections and whether they should be playing the centerpiece role that they are. Um, okay. So a background thought I, I think we have to accept is that 
the current system, uh, the use of representatives is pretty much required. So people have talked about direct democracy where everybody would get a vote on everything. We wouldn't have representatives. Uh, we, the ignorance problems that I talked about earlier, I think would just become much more intensified there. So we just don't know enough about all the different policy options to really do that kind of system. We need representatives. So then there are questions. We could choose them by election as we do. Uh, we could have some kind of other way of doing it. So we could have an appointment system uh, we could have birthright as they used to. Uh, I think we should take seriously an old mechanism that has been around since the Athenians invented democracy, which is the use of random selection. Okay, so there's a lot of work and discussion about this. So I'm not the only person by any means thinking about this and talking about this. There's a very nice book, The Political Potential of Sortition by Oliver Dowlin, that gives kind of a historical survey of all the places and all you know the times where they've used random selection of people to put people into political office of various kinds. And so in ancient Athens, late medieval and early Renaissance Italy, a uh, lot of political institutions were populated by random selection or the use of some random selection at various points in the process. Uh, and more recently, and really interestingly, citizens assemblies have started to become a commonplace thing. So in Canada and in Europe, especially, uh, you're seeing wide uh, use of these. So more than you know, 100 examples already where citizens have been chosen at random from the political community and brought together to focus on one particular policy problem or uh, issue with the constitution or something to kind of think about what ought to be done politically. Um, all right, so that's kind of the inspiration that I'm starting with. What I wanna do is kind of talk through how we might build that system out a little bit more. So it's not just kind of a one-off institution. So I think a natural set of concerns arise when people talk about using random selection. So two big ones. Uh, one is that it's giving a lot of power to these few people, perhaps, who were just randomly picked out of the air. And there's a question about what philosophers call legitimacy, you know, what gives them the right to rule, given that we didn't choose them, uh, whether they'd be representative in the right way, and maybe worries about how this would actually work in practice. Uh, relating to that, first, that last point, I think there's a real worry about whether randomly chosen citizens would be competent, whether they would know enough to kind of govern effectively. And so a lot of the design that I talk about in the book is thinking about, well, how can we think about those two problems and respond to them through institutional design, through trying to make the system work? Okay, so I'm just gonna go as an overview now, the kind of basic features of the lotocratic system, as I call it. Um, so first, you'd have, just focus on the legislative branch for now. The legislative function would be fulfilled by many different single issue legislatures. So focused on a topic area. So agriculture or health or transportation or education, rather than by a kind of single generalist legislature like Congress, where they are supposed to enact policy and law over a wide range of different topics. So imagine there's you know 25 different area divided single issue legislative bodies. Call those SILs, single issue lottery selected legislatures. The members of these SILs would be chosen by lottery from the relevant political jurisdiction. And the basic mechanism is that they would uh, um, hear from experts on the relevant topic, experts, advocates, stakeholders of various kinds at the beginning of each legislative session. So in a bit more detail, imagine that each of these SILs would have 300 people chosen at random. There'd be 25 to 30 of them. Pure random selection from the population, uh, you know, maybe require them to be adults over the age of 18. Each person chosen would serve for a three-year term. Terms would be staggered, so they have 100 new people starting at a time. You wouldn't, I wouldn't require that people serve, but there'd be kind of financial incentives so maybe pay them each year one and a half times their ordinary income and try to accommodate family and work schedules. Some of it could be done virtually. It's trying to make it as easy as possible to let everybody who has been randomly chosen to actually participate, uh, give people legal protections as we do with jury service so that they wouldn't be hurt in terms of their employment um, and maybe give people the chance to postpone for a little while. Um, okay, so then in addition, people would have to agree 
to while they were serving to be monitored, to make sure that they weren't taking bribes or other kinds of things. And similarly, after they've left office, trying to make sure that they weren't being paid off after the fact for things that they had advocated for. Okay, and then the basic structure, uh, each of these lottery selected legislatures would meet for two sessions each calendar year, and each session would have these different stages. So a kind of agenda setting for the next time, uh, a learning phase. So you've decided we're gonna focus on a particular issue. So maybe we wanna you know, change zoning rules in you know, a particular municipality, or maybe we wanna decide whether we wanna do more nuclear energy or less nuclear energy, kind of shifting our energy policy and priorities. So there'd be a learning phase where you'd get experts coming to talk to the randomly chosen citizens. Um, included in experts wouldn't just be academics. It would be people with occupational experience that was relevant, uh, activists who'd been working on this issue for some time, uh, perhaps stakeholders too, people who represented trade and industry groups. Now everyone would have to be identified uh, and they'd have to say who they are, who's paying their, you know, for them to be there. Uh, that kind of thing, uh, but that's the, the, the model. So during this learning phase, people would gather a lot of information, learn about the issue. Uh, then there'd be kind of a public consultation phase where people would go and talk to members of their communities, go back to where they were from or do this virtually, kind of talk through some of the things they were thinking about and you know, trying to kind of uh, get information about broader public views. And this could be more or less structured. You could do some polling, some sophisticated opinion data gathering, uh, and also some informal things. And the hope is to kind of create a channel for the broader public to offer some ideas and thoughts and input, but also for the randomly chosen citizens to provide some sense of you know, where they were mentally about these issues. Uh, then there'd be you know, extended periods of deliberation and discussion leading to drafting and revising a policy and then eventually voting. And, and on my model, they'd have the power to directly enact policy, All right? So that's a kind of basic model. Now quickly, I'll just talk through what I think of as some of the potential advantages. Um, so hopefully this would help to address the ignorance and capture worries. So by having this learning phase and the kind of single issue focus, it lowers the epistemic burden on individuals. It lowers how much people have to learn about the issue uh, to do a good job, right? So they'll come to learn about you know, farm subsidy policy. They might not have known anything about it, but they'll you know, spend a month or so learning in some detail about it, and for many people, you know, if you do this for three years, you'd come to be pretty knowledgeable about it and have a much more informed opinion than the, the median voter, certainly. Hopefully that would also make it better with respect to capture of representatives. So random selection is gonna prevent the influence that powerful interests currently have through elections, right? So if it's truly random, they can't influence that process people selected don't have to raise funds for re-election so they're not spending half their time trying to get money coming in and so saying things to powerful wealthy people or making sure that the kind of powerful corporate media continues to take a shine to them uh, by you know saying all kinds of things that are congenial to those powerful interests the kind of regular random rotation of people through political power makes it hard to buy people off so you know jesse helms from north carolina is in the you know in political power for 40 years. And so the tobacco lobby knew they just had to go to him, get him uh, to have the power, and then they could just effectively control policy through him. Uh, that'd be harder to do with 300 randomly chosen people coming through. Uh, and if you paid people well enough, I think it would make it difficult to buy them off, right? So if they condition your, their pay on not uh, you know, cheating or talking to lobbyists and that kind of thing, that would improve things. I think it would help address the kind of short-term thinking problem. So randomly chosen people can just think long-term as any of us might. Um, you'd get a more demographically representative sample. So, you know, the median age in the US Senate is 63. Many of these people aren't thinking, you know, they're not 34 just having had their third kid and thinking about the future. Uh, they're in a different life stage and worried about different kinds of things. Uh, and so those might be other kinds of advantages. Uh, but the main one really is uh, you just don't have the powerful electoral incentive focusing your attention like a spotlight on these two or four years. I think it would make it harder to manipulate people just through these emotional appeals and the sound bites. People would actually learn about the issues in a way that would give them some knowledge to kind of combat that sort of simple emotional uh, three minute news segment that otherwise might drive their opinion. Uh, the randomly chosen people don't have to worry about looking soft on crime or 
national defense or military policy. They can just think about what should our priorities be and act in response to those. I think it might be better with respect to the in-group out-group problem. So first of all, we get rid of elections in the background that structure us into these two teams that are at war with each other. We reorient people towards focusing on single issue policy making. So thinking about what are the problems we actually face and what do we wanna do about them? So I think that reorientation and getting rid of elections will make a big difference. Uh, by getting people to actually talk to each other, uh, you know, if part of the division that we feel in our society is a kind of manufactured thing as a result of the media we consume and what we come to believe about people who we never meet and never will meet, uh, if we get people actually in a room talking to each other, I think you might see real progress. So in Ireland, they had citizens assemblies to help reform uh, the Irish constitution, in particular looking at abortion and same-sex marriage, really heated issues, uh, but they made huge strides in actually making change to the law and understanding each other. So a lot of interesting work coming out of there, but just the transformative nature of the experience really changed people. Uh, and then finally, I think they'd be clearly better with respect to kind of demographic and epistemic diversity. So by choosing people at random, you get all of this input from people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different kinds of professional experience. You, know, you actually get people in power who have been the primary caretaker of children, who've been nurses and construction workers and scientists, who've gone to community college, who've been on welfare. All of these kinds of people have a lot to add, I think, in terms of their knowledge and experience in terms of the problems that we actually face and should be addressing, they'll be attuned to these things in a way that the socioeconomic elite just aren't and we'll get them to serve by choosing at random. Okay, lots of objections, lots of potential worries, uh, but I'm gonna stop there so that there's time for questions. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Alex. That was fascinating. And we have the questions are rolling in quickly. So I'm going to try to maybe even bundle some of them on occasion because there are so many good and interesting questions, which is always a sign of a provocative talk. So let me start with a few of them. The first one is less a question than a, maybe a quip itself, but I'll just repeat it, which is, does your system remind anyone of William F. Buckley's famous quip that he'd rather be governed by 2000 people randomly selected from the Boston phone book than by the entire Harvard faculty. That comes to mind as a rather obvious one, but let me move on to some more uh, substantive questions here of there, which there are many. Um, one important one that comes up very quickly in this is who gets to decide who is an expert and who gets to decide what the issues are that constitute issues to tackle. Those questions emerge in several different forms here. Can you say something about that? Sure, yeah, so I've got um, chapters in the book that like, I think these are great and important issues. So we don't think that much about who is an expert, what is expertise and how does it come into political decision-making enough? I think those are actually really important issues and there's some you know, limited discussion but there's much less than there ought to be given the importance, I think. Um, so in, in this system, you know, an important role is given for expertise, but there is then a question, well, who would actually get to speak? So what they've done for actual citizens assemblies that have existed, they often are dealing with uh, kind of clear pockets of you know, policy areas. So in British Columbia, for example, the issue was whether to shift from a plurality voting system to something like a single transferable vote voting system. And so they brought in political scientists who work on voting, voting theory, and had them give presentations about these different systems, where they were used, some of their strengths, some of their weaknesses. But these were academics coming in and speaking. And it was kind of a clear, you know, these were appropriate people. Other topics, I think it's a little bit more controversial, exactly who should be speaking. I think you would get a mix of academics with those kinds of credentials. You'd also, I think, want to have people who had occupational experience and so in the law, we have a system for vetting who gets to speak as an expert in a courtroom. They have a number of different tests. Won't go through them all here, but that's the kind of thing that we might consider. Um, I also think we should consider, and I argue for this in a different paper you can find on my website, um, 
we should consider trying to create something like a database of expertise where experts could, you know, candidate experts could say, here's why I'm an expert, here's why I should be included, and have it organized by topic, have there be some kind of vetting of who's in there, but, you know, maybe all kinds of people could be included, and then when we're trying to decide what we ought to do, we could kind of look, well, who's got the right kinds of credentials and experience, and maybe randomly choose the people to speak from that database. So I talk about that in more detail. The thought being we want to avoid too much in the way of cherry picking of experts who might not either really be experts. So pseudo expertise is a real worry. Uh, but another worry is that, well, maybe 99 of the experts of the hundreds say one thing, but then the other side picks the one person who doesn't. And some sort of random procedure for choosing the experts would help us avoid that kind of problem. Uh, but yeah, my, there's a lot you know, in there about expertise. In terms of is issue and topic, uh, again, you know, I list 25 different areas, roughly matching things that either currently have administrative agencies or subcommittees within Congress. So uh, any generalist legislature operates by use of a lot of subcommittees already that focus on different topics. And so a lot of what I'm doing focusing on single issue legislatures is just kind of making salient these underlying structures that exist even within generalist legislatures. Uh, some issues straddle a couple different committees, subcommittees now. In that case, there could be mechanisms by which they could be brought together to work on an issue together. Uh, the agenda setting phase would be the way where within an area like transportation or agriculture, the specific ideas would be honed down. And one possibility there is it could be through kind of broad community input that suggests, okay, here are the 20 candidate items that maybe should be on the agenda. And then the citizen, the randomly chosen citizens would kind of look at these different proposals, hear from advocates of these different ideas as to why we should maybe put this as the agenda item to talk about whether we should actually do this thing. So that's a place I think for broader uh, political participation to try to get things on the agenda. Uh, but yeah, those are excellent questions. I can't do them full justice here. Okay, terrific. And that, that answers a number of questions in the in the process. A, and a series of interesting questions has come in though about the role and really the protection of minority interests in this process. Jayla Rhodes asked, how does the non-stratified selection method of those selected take minorities into account? I'm thinking about cultural differences in racial and economic groups, for example, that can guide policy that might be harmful to others if they're not aware of their perspective, which is a super question. And Sarah Fang asks somewhat similarly, this is such an interesting concept, I've never thought about it before, but if legislatures are chosen by randomized lottery from all citizens, would it create something like what we now have as court juries in order to create legislature, to create legislation? Since we know that inherent biases in jurors can skew legal decisions that have to do with race, how would this be addressed in the form of a sill? I think those questions are interesting to think about together as they both sort of suggest you know, what, what is representative in the end? Yeah, well, one important thing is that we're choosing quite a lot of people, right? So if we were just choosing 10 people or 12 people, mm -hmm. we might worry about odd skews. So you could get, you know, 10 non-Hispanic white members of a particular, you know, uh, body, and that really might not be representative in the right way. That would look much more like Congress does now, uh, and that might trouble us, I think. So but we're choosing thousands of people as we would be here, just the, you know, the statistics work out so that you would get a very proportionate representation of the actual political community. Now, obviously, if we're in you know, a really large political community and there's a very small minority within that group and we want them represented, they will continue to be a very small number of people who are represented. And there's a way in which, well, that's appropriate because proportionate representation seems like a reasonable principle. And there still might be worries that that's not enough. So Heather Gherkin, a law professor at Yale, has this nice idea of what she calls second order diversity, which suggests we need some institutions that aren't just proportionately diverse in this way, but that in which you actually have overrepresentation of minority groups so that sometimes you have a minority group that's in the majority within somebody. And random randomness would mean that sometimes that might happen or something close to that would happen. Uh, but it might not happen enough. And there might be some policy areas where we think we actually do want to do stratified oversampling from certain groups because of the topic. Now, I'll worry about that is that as soon as you start to do that, you kind of reify, you kind of make more important 
whatever that dimension of identity is. And so in some cases it might be easy, maybe if you're in uh, South, you know, post-apartheid South Africa, the black white division is just so obviously important in political life that it makes sense. We're gonna have to continue to track that, uh, but it does also entrench it. So as soon as you start saying, we need to make sure it's 70%, 30% or whatever the proportionate numbers are, uh, then you're going to be paying attention to that factor forever. And I think there are worries about forcing people to mobilize around some part of their identity, even if it doesn't align with everything else they might think. A nice thing about the random selection is you're going to get proportionate representation over time. I think the other big thing for minority interests is currently so many of our institutions are majoritarian. So uh, the African-American law professor, Lonnie Guineer, uh, you know, spent a lot of her career, has spent a lot of her career arguing that what you see by way of racial representation in political representation now is a kind of tokenism where you get, you know, one or two people but they, in the legislature, but they're not powerful enough by themselves to get anything done. So they don't actually effectively advocate for their political community. Um, if they're representing a minority community in these majoritarian bodies. And because they're all paying attention to electoral incentives, they won't. You know, the elected officials who aren't representing minority districts don't have to pay attention to minority interests. Randomly chosen citizens would have their ears open to everybody. If there was an issue that predominantly affected a particular minority group, there's no reason they couldn't make good policy on that topic. And furthermore, they'd really hear from people who were affected by it in a way that might transform the opinions of people who had otherwise not thought about it very much because being in this majority group, they'd never had to. So where they've used these bodies, I think it has been really transformative where minority views really do get a different kind of airing and to people who really do have their ears open, uh, particularly when you imagine the kind of background dynamics shifting away from this electoral competition where we don't have the in-group, out-group reinforcement through the elections in the background. Uh, that said, if you're in a country that's super racist, any democratic system is going to inherit a lot of that racism, right? So it doesn't fix everything. And those are things that you need to continue to worry about. And a reason you might well want something like a constitutional court, like the Supreme Court, uh, that somehow is supposed to be standing in to protect minority rights and interests against even randomly selected kind of majority decision making. Um, but yeah, those are important and hard questions. It's interesting because that segues rather interestingly into the next question, which has to do also with how to not reproduce in some ways entrenched inequalities. So an interesting question comes here about that does your system presume some kind of egalitarian and very effective national education system? How would you address the fact that sometimes even within the same location, such great educational disparities exist that it might give people very different knowledge bases to start this process. I'm actually gonna even bundle that with another question since we have so few minutes left and your talk has elicited an enormous number of questions. Um, another question that it is really isn't related at all, but maybe you can very briefly tackle one or the other um, has to do with what this system is most suited for in terms of which kinds of issues. And can you do foreign policy and international questions with this system? Or is this really only work for kinds of things that um, concern people's everyday lives in sort of tangible lived ways? Great. Uh, so on the first question, I think a, a nice thing about this kind of system is it really makes transparent why it's important to have a serious public education system where everybody, not just the elite, get a serious high quality education, right? So it has kind of as a side effect this like, well, if you really had this system in place, we would care much more about making sure that everybody got an excellent education rather than just the elite. I think that's good. In the absence of that, I think there might be questions about would we see you know, the people have the most education talking the most and driving the discussion and driving policy. And I think we might, uh, unless we're careful in thinking about how we structure the deliberation and the discussion. So lots of studies about how juries work and who rises to the fore and to kind of be more dominant in those groups. Uh, I think same in educational settings, you have to think about who's dominating the classroom discussion. Um, there are ways around this. There are strategies to counteract this through, I think, thoughtful moderation, turn-taking, making sure everybody gets equal airtime, 
uh, but also through competence building. So a lot of the people who've gone through these citizens assemblies felt like they learned quite a bit and they had small group discussions. They made sure everybody was on board and learning. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that is a way of kind of equalizing uh, the process, making sure certain individuals don't just dominate because of their uh, kind of background uh, social advantages. Um, the second question, I just blanked on it. Can you just assent? Uh, you can you can you can move on if oh, you like, foreign but policy. it has to do with yeah. either foreign policy. Yeah. No, I think so. I don't talk. I didn't talk about here. I think the executive currently does a lot of things. Uh, you know, national defense, uh, foreign policy, immigration. Uh, I think a lot of that could be replicated with what I call executive assemblies that'd be made up of randomly chosen citizens, uh, perhaps uh, combined with people who had more kind of uh, domain relevant expertise. So people who'd served in foreign service, who'd served in the military. And so you might have 70% random chosen citizens and 30% people who had this kind of experience as part of their background. Uh, but that, that is kind of how I envision the kind of foreign service uh, kind of international affairs, uh, national security decisions being made still by uh, randomly chosen citizens. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we only have time for one last question, much as this could go on for a long time. But I'm going to point to something that comes up here that takes us in a slightly different direction. Both Eric Schoemaker and Johnny Thacker uh, bring up questions about whether this wouldn't lead to greater political apathy, actually, rather than political enthusiasm. In Eric Schumacher's case, what about the people who aren't chosen to participate? Would they have any reason to be invested in this? And Johnny Thacker writes, let me find that question again. Is there a danger that the population as a whole would become even more apathetic about politics than they currently are, knowing the chances that they would have no role to play in political decision-making in a given year? Would that matter to you? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. So uh, one, it might depend on how prevalent these kinds of autocratic institutions were. So. You know, at the federal level, if this was all of it, then your odds of being selected are pretty low, uh, quite low. Uh, but if they also were at the municipal level, the county level, the state level, your odds of being selected for some kind of significant political role over your lifetime would go up quite a lot. Uh, so I think that's you know, one thing to say is just how apathetic you're likely to be. But I think the main thing to say is I actually think these bodies would be so much more open-eared to the broader uh, political community than what we currently get through elections. So right now we get this one moment of choice where you get to say, you know, which of A or B is going to be your representative. That's about all the input or choice influence you have. Most of what you might else otherwise try to say to them, it's gonna be hard to communicate to them because they're gonna be captured as I argue. Um, randomly chosen citizens from these communities are gonna be much more open to hearing from people from those communities. So if you had an interest in trying to influence the direction of policy in an area, you'd have these avenues in which to do so. So both in the agenda setting phase, but also in the public consultation phase and in the learning phase, these would be places where ordinary citizens who hadn't been randomly chosen could really become advocates and activists and communicate with these randomly chosen citizens in a way that I think would be uh, for people who had interests in that regard, uh, a real, um, uh, awakening of a participation possibility that doesn't exist currently. So I think uh, my hope is over time, it would energize people around politics, but in a productive way, not in a way where they, you know, constantly refresh election results every two or four years and are frantically anxious, but basically otherwise feel completely powerless. Like they think a lot about politics, but their actions very rarely affect anything that happens in politics. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's our current state. I'd like us to get to a place where we actually could influence things in a more intimate and direct way, uh, particularly with the issues that we care about. Um, I, I wanted to say before we end, please email, uh, get in touch any way you like. Uh, as the project suggests, I like hearing from people from all kinds of backgrounds and different kinds of experiences. So uh, the project's very much in progress. So it's very helpful for me if you reach out and I like to hear from people. Yes, we've had a wonderful series of questions and Alex, thank you. So much. I should just add for those of you who haven't gotten enough of listening to Professor Zero, um, he also teaches a massive MOOC or massive online course through Coursera called Revolutionary Ideas and Introduction to Legal and Political Philosophy. It's free, and I gather it has about 150,000 students signed up to date, so we must do something right online. 
So um, please join me in thanking Professor Guerrero. And also let me say that um, we hope he'll be joining us again next week for another talk for those of you with this philosophical bent. And um, thank you all, have a very good evening. Thank you.